Welcome to the Open Forum. Once again, we have the opportunity to look together into the Word of God to discover truth. Now, before we get into our program, I, first of all, do want to make a correction. Last week, someone asked me a question about the little book that is spoken about in the book of Revelation, and I indicated that it was a, uh, it identified with the seven thunders and, and probably had nothing to do with the book that uh, the book of Daniel speaks about. But uh, uh, I'm afraid that I answered far, far too quickly and without careful uh, preparation because when I have looked at this more carefully and more seriously over the weekend, I find that indeed it probably does, it is the uh, same book that we read about that was sealed in the time of, the, of, the, of Daniel and which was opened by the Lord Jesus Christ. The reason is that when we look at, uh, uh, when we look at, let, let's just spend a couple minutes and look at this. In Revelation 10, I saw another angel, this is verse 1, another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head and his face was that were the sun and his feet as pillars of fire now there can be no question at all that has to be the Lord Jesus Christ the feet that his uh, feet as pillars of fire indicates that he had gone through the fires of God's wrath and making payment for our sins and uh, he, uh, the rainbow upon his head is uh, to indicate that he is the one that has provided uh, uh, the, a, a tie-in between sinful man and Almighty God, uh, it, uh, uh, and, and so on. And he had in his hand a little book open. Now, we read in Revelation chapter 8, verse 1, that at, uh, at the a time when there was silence in heaven for a half hour, and we correctly understand that to be the first part of the Great Tribulation, which uh, that 23-year period that precedes Judgment Day itself and the rapture of all the believers that happens the first day of Judgment Day. Uh, and uh, the book was open, and that agrees with the fact that seven seals had been taken off. If it is the book of Daniel, the, the book spoken of in Daniel, why is it called a little book? Well, now that's not difficult because uh, the Bible is the book, and uh, this is an, uh, uh, something that's always been in the Bible, but effectively it's an addition to the Bible because God is opening our spiritual eyes to it, and whereas the Bible encompasses uh, uh, 13,000 years of history, we find that, that uh, the uh, little book or the book uh, of Daniel is speaking especially about the last days, the time uh, of the great tribulation leading into judgment day itself. And uh, so I believe that it, it would have to agree that it is uh, the speaking again of the same book that was spoken of in Revelation 5 that Christ opened and uh, by the time of Revelation 8 verse 1 all the seals had been taken off and now it's referred to again as an open book. Incidentally the seven thunders when we look at that more carefully it says seal up those things in verse 3 or verse 4 which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. That has to do with information that God could tell us about the end, and he never did tell us. It's not written even anywhere. It's sealed up. It's uh, before it was even written. And uh, uh, simply to indicate, yes, there's more to say, but God has given us all that he wishes to give us. And uh, so the little book uh, we read was open. We... Uh, uh, we read in verse 7 uh, uh, 
in, in, or verse uh, 10, and I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And, oh, it, he indicated in the days, verse 7, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he begins to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. And uh, when the seventh angel sounds, we read that in verse 15 of Revelation 11, uh, the seventh angel sounded, and there were voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world are become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever. And, but ahead of that, we read in verse 10, where the Apostle John took the little book out of the angel's hand, or out of the messenger's hand, that is, out of Christ's hand, and ate it up. And uh, this is what we do when we are studying the Bible. We are eating the Word of God. We're gaining nourishment. We're getting uh, spiritual strength from the Word of God. And what was his reaction to it? He ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey, because, you know, any aspect of the gospel is uh, concerning the kingdom of God, and it is uh, the kingdom of God is a land of milk and honey. But then notice in verse uh, 10 of Revelation 10, that it was sweet as honey, but as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And that agrees with what Daniel's experience was when he had read or heard what was in that book before he was told to seal it. It made him very ill because it has to do with the time of the end. And there's nothing very happy in talking about the final judgment plan of God and the judgment day and the, and the very end of the world. But that is the kind of information that was in that book. But nevertheless, he then followed in verse 11. God told the Apostle John, and he's telling us, of course, it's God speaking, uh, in uh, verse the ten, eat it, and it, it's sweet as honey, and it makes your belly bitter. Uh, in other words, it's, it makes you sick. But he said unto me, Thou shalt prophesy again before many people and nations and tongues and kings. And that agrees with the fact that it is in our day that we have all this new additional information dealing strictly with the time of the end, but casting its impact all the way upon all that the Bible has ever said. Because when we compare Scripture with Scripture, or we can't really know we have ever had a true understanding of a verse until we are able to compare it with everything in the Bible, and it's in our day that we're able to do that because we have this final information from this little book that has been given to us. So I hope that will clarify that. My answer last week was very incorrect, I'm very sure of, and I, and I wanted to make that correction. But now, shall we go to our first caller on our telephone lines? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, yes, the word lightning in the New Testament is there nine times. We see that, for example, in Matthew 24, 27, 28, 3, Luke 17, 24, 24, 7, and Revelation 4, 5. And guess what? That word lightning is the same word we see in Luke 10, 18, where it talks about Satan uh, falling down to the earth like lightning, and therefore that Satan has to be the Lord Jesus Christ himself, because out of the nine times this word appears in the New uh, Testament... I'm, excuse, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Excuse me. No, just a minute. You know, just because you find a word used in one context to indicate whatever it does in that context, you may not say that, therefore, every time that word appears is in the same, uh, bringing the same kind of a meaning. It, you must examine the context, and a word can be used 
uh, can be used in the, uh, like for example we talked about the word son like the word son normally the word son has to do with the Lord Jesus Christ but it's also a word that is used in connection with Satan he's called the son of perdition or the son of wickedness or, or uh, and and uh, so uh, please you uh, you are uh, you are making a judgment that is not valid it is not fitting according to the Bible we have to as we compare scripture with scripture we have to look at the context not just at a single word but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum hi mr. Campy yes I wanted to call and ask you about the the, the Johns in the New Testament uh, excuse me would you turn your radio off that will help Oh, it's clear across the room. I didn't think you could hear it. Just a second. Okay, I'm sorry. Is that better? No, go ahead. Okay, um, I'm calling about the, uh, the, the many Johns that are in the New Testament, and I'm wondering if they're the same. For instance, the ones that I'm mentioning I'm particularly interested in. Uh, well, the many Johns. There is John the Baptist, for example. Who no, was... no, I'm not. I'm not referring to him. Let me just tell you about the ones that I'm interested in. The one who wrote the uh, fourth gospel, and the one who wrote the, the epistles or the letters. The the apostle John. And then is, the one. Excuse me. The apostle John is the one God used to give us the. Uh, Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. He also wrote the three epistles, 1st John, 2nd John, 3rd John. Actually, God wrote, and he was the scribe. And he also has given us the book of Revelation. That's the ones that I wanted to know, the ones you just mentioned. They're all one and the same person. They're all one and the same person. Okay, well, that's, that's what I needed to know, and I appreciate your help. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping. Yes. I have two questions about the five months of Revelation 9. Yes. In order for there to be exactly five months left after the rapture, we have to use our modern-day Gregorian calendar. My question is, how do we justify switching from the Hebrew calendar to the Gregorian calendar? Well, because the, God used the calendar that's... Uh, uh, God can use any calendar. You know, he used a calendar in the days of Noah that was the uh, uh, the only calendar that was in vogue, and that had a 360-day year. So every several years there would have had to have been an adjustment, but God doesn't tell how that was. But that is the calendar that he ties into. On the other hand, in uh, in uh, uh, other places, he uses the calendar of the Bible. In our day, he uses both. He uses both the ca the modern calendar, the the uh, and and uh, and incidentally, when we when we uh, uh, work out the timeline of history, we tie everything to our calendar. We coordinate it all into our calendar. So when we're saying that the creation occurred 11,013 B.C., that is when it's coordinated with our calendar. And it's significant that you get those two numbers, 11 and 13, because 11 is pointing to the first coming of Christ, and 13 is pointing to the second coming of Christ. But it's it's a it's a calendar that's tied into our Gregorian calendar, and now in our day God uses both the biblical calendar and our calendar. Uh, he uses five months of our calendar, but on the other hand, when we look at May 21, 2011, we find that the biblical uh, calendar for that day is the 17th day of the second month. And so, by using, utilizing these various calendars, that gives God freedom to uh, to uh, 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 make more tie-ins than uh, uh, and 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 
uh, uh, work out his program in a very, very beautiful way than if he did not have that option. When the Bible speaks of the lake of fire, is that referring to the entire five-month period? In other words, those who are left behind on May 21, will, I, they, have, will they have been effectively cast alive into the lake of fire? I think that the lake of fire has to do, it's called the second death, and it has to do with the final destruction. You know, we read in... in um, Mm, we read in uh, where it, it talks about uh, I'm, oh Second Peter. That's what I want. Second Peter. Second Peter. It it says finally, uh, verse ten, verse chapter three, verse ten. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are in shall be burned up, and uh, that will be the the last day. Look as we look at verse 12, looking for and hasting under the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. As near as we can tell, it is the final uh, burning up uh, annihilation of everything that has to do with this present. Creation. Now, uh, we may, we may not have this with absolute accuracy, uh, because this uh, language is is not not always easy to follow. But it is uh, it is probable uh, we do know that the five months will be a time of great suffering, and if the if the whole universe is on fire, uh, then nobody could be living through that five months. So we'd have to conclude that. In all likelihood, the lake of fire is is the final annihilation, destruction, the burning up of the whole universe. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Camping. It's nice to be able to speak with you. Um, we just had a friend who just died, and I don't know if if they were saved or not, but... I wanted to know, because they wanted to pray for them, for their souls, and for this, and, and I just told them that, you know, there's really nothing that we can do about it now. But is, what is the scripture? I know there's a scripture that says that once you're dead, that's it. You know, you're well, dead. Well, here, here's, here's the fact. Once a person dies, whether they're a true believer or not, there's absolutely no purpose at all in praying for them, for their soul or for anything else about them. They, they have died. Now, if your friend was a true believer, it means that his body is in the grave and it's decaying, but in his soul existence, he left his body and is uh, alive with Christ in heaven. And uh, there's nothing you can change about that. Uh, he is eternally secure. And on the last day, he will receive his body as a glorified, resurrected body so that he'll live eternally with Christ. But on the other hand, if he died unsaved, it simply means both soul and body, he's dead. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Uh, they've, and, uh, and he's dead, and he'll never have ever again conscious existence. He's, there's no more suffering that he will uh, be aware of. He has been, he has, uh, uh, his body will be thrown out of the grave on the first day of the great, uh, of the day of judgment and be shamed in the eyes of God. But he won't be aware of that. That his, his insofar as anything that he's aware of, he has no more, will ever have any conscious existence. He is dead. And uh, he at least had the, the pleasure of enjoying this life, living out his life in, here, and uh, now uh, he has come to an end. He, he of course, has lost the opportunity uh, to be inheritors of the new heaven and the new earth if he died unsaved. Uh, he uh, will uh, never live again with Christ. But on the other hand, he 
uh, he uh, is not going to be suffering any more consciously. Any kind of scripture that where it says that the dead will, you know, you can't, they don't listen, they can't, you can't do anything for them. Is there a scripture that I could give can't, my friends? No, you can't do anything. You, you know, I, when, when a person dies, the person that we have to be concerned with is not the dead person. They're dead. And either they're with the Lord in their soul existence or they've ceased to exist altogether. And we can't change anything. But it is a message to us who are still alive. Suppose I was in that casket. Suppose that was me. Where would I be? Would I simply be a, a dead corpse, soul and body, and that's the end of it all? Or would I have... A, a, uh, will I be with Christ uh, in my soul existence looking forward to that eternity of being with Christ in the new heaven and the new earth and all the gigantic and wonderful, wonderful, wonderful blessings that go with that. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, good evening, Brother Camping. Yes. You know, I was reading in the book of Genesis where after God expelled Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, he put this sword, of like a flashing sword, to guard the entrance to the Garden of Eden. And I believe the Bible says that sword will be there forever and ever and ever. So where is that sword now? If well, it's going to well, be there forever, it has uh, to be uh, somewhere, uh, right? Well, excuse me. Let's see once what it does say about it. Let's say, see what it says about it. We read in... Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims. That is a reference to God as the judge. And a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. It doesn't say forever and ever and ever there at all. But Christ, of course, is... A eternal judge, but it is a reference to the fact that they, the tree of life represents the Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, the flaming sword and the cherubim uh, indicate that the only way we can get to the mercy of Christ uh, or have the mercy of Christ is if our sins have been paid for, and that requires that someone must must uh, bear the wrath of God in our place. It turns out that that is the Lord Jesus Christ who does, who, who is the one that must bear the wrath of God for us. But until that is done, uh, and that would be a, 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 a spiritually the way we would get past the flaming sword. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, uh, Mr. Campy. I was just uh, referring to the, the lady, I guess, she was asking about uh, a friend who died, and she was asking if there was a scripture, you know, that said uh, you can't, you know, communicate or whatever. What came to my mind is um, in Luke um, 16, the parable of the uh, rich man and Lazarus, where it kind of says, you know, he can't go back and he can't, you know, communicate once he's dead. Well, yes, that's a parable, and that's yeah, very difficult that's kind of... to understand because the rich man is in hell, but that hell actually is the grave, and he's speaking to Laz uh, to Abraham in heaven, and uh, and that c can never be, of course, literally, and so it's pretty hard to uh, to get a very concrete uh, and easy understanding from that. It is a parable. Uh, it's only if we see the spiritual meaning of the various aspects of it that we right. can see the truth. And the other scriptures, Hebrews, uh, which that lady might, if she's still listening, Hebrews uh, 9.27. Hebrews 9.27. Let's, let's look at that. Hebrews 9.27. We read there, Hebrews 9.27. And as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. And that, again, is a very difficult verse to understand. 
uh, because it, it seems to indicate that we die and then there is uh, we're going to be resurrected to stand for judgment and uh, actually what it's saying is we will die and uh, and uh, our bodies they're still a, a part of the judgment program that has to take place but we will not be conscious of that because we're dead we're uh, the soul that sinneth it shall die so again it is not a verse that is very helpful it also is a verse that is is somewhat difficult to understand but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum yeah hi uh i have been able to get you on the radio for a long time and just tonight i did and it seems when you say there's no more conscious consciousness of what's going on I mean, isn't that part of hell? Well, the fact is that that hell is a word that is also very commonly translated grave. And when we're dead, we're dead. The soul that's in it, it shall die. The idea of a hell or a place of torment that's going to go on forever and ever, that was... Uh, uh, taught uh, throughout the church age by virtually every denomination, but it was totally incorrect. It, that's an impossible idea. It is foreign to the character of God. It is foreign to the law of God. Uh, the law of God would not permit that kind of a thing happening. But that's, from what I remember for years and years, that's what you were teaching. Yes, of course I was, because that's the way all uh, that's the way we all were taught in all of the churches, and and it's in these last years as as God has opened the book of Daniel that 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 is the book that Daniel we read about in Daniel 12 sealed this up. It's for the time of the end, and now that has been opened, and there's a great amount of information that we know today that has never, never known before. And I'll tell you, it's required lots and lots of correction in order to be more faithful to the Word of God. But if we recognize that the Bible is God's Word and we want to be faithful to it, we don't hesitate to make correction as we find it in the Bible. We've got to pause for this message. We, uh, we're, uh, there are, someone is looking for a verse that tells us that when we die, we die. You know, in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, we read uh, in verse 19, For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth the beasts, that is, animals. Even one thing befalleth them, as the one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they all have one breath. So that a man has no preeminence above a beast, for all is vanity. All go into one place. All are, are, are of the dust, and all turn to dust again. It's not talking about a saved person, because we get a brand new eternal soul at the moment we become saved, and that's why it's an entirely different story. But if we don't get that eternal soul, this is what God is declaring is going to happen to us. We read in Psalm 49, in uh, Psalm 49, uh, uh, where he says, uh, Man, in verse uh, 20, Man that is in honor and understandeth not is like the beast, like the animal that perisheth. Uh, and uh, it's, the, it's the same idea. When the animal dies, that's the end of the animal. The body decays, and the only difference is that uh, God still has a, uh, going to shame that person because uh, at the, on the first day of the, of the d day of judgment, his corpse or his bones or whatever is left of them, if, if the, of him is going to be thrown out and uh, desecrated and uh, shamed in the eyes of God and those that God wants to view that. and uh, even, But that person will not know that. He is simply dead. It's only when we become saved that we are given a brand new resurrected soul at the moment of salvation. And then the whole scenario is entirely different. 
But shall we take the next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping. How are you doing tonight? Very well, thank you. That's good to hear. Mr. Camping, I have a question here I, uh, concerning your book. We're almost there. Uh, I see, uh, I read it about four times, and I see that you were very dogmatic concerning uh, the timeline. Uh, however, I gave uh, the book, I read the book also, Time Has an End, and there's uh, many uh, uh, likelihoods it's possible, even September or October 22nd it could happen. And my, I, I was dogmatic to my friend because I believe, without a doubt, May 21st is the end of 2011. And when he read the book uh, and he heard me talking, it was conflicting, giving conflicting reports. And I see in your track, too, I pass out tracks, and I just noticed that you have uh, two books, uh, Time Has an End, and we're almost there. Do you think it would be wise to... Uh, Give people uh, time has an end with a knowledge that we, you and uh, others right. know that. A a excuse me, I understand your question. Time has an end was published about four years, or maybe a little tiny bit earlier than that, but I think about four years ago. At that time, uh, 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 the, uh, all of this time information was coming to fruition. I was learning it. Uh, and uh, yet, very carefully, I said, you know, uh, it's, uh, it sounds very, very probable. It seems that the, the, that the work that has been done is accurate, but there might be something we've missed, and we, we, we can only say that it's, it's, it's highly likely. But then about a year and a half ago, when uh, I was completing... Uh, uh, the book, we're almost there. Uh, we r ran into some very big proofs from the Bible. Now, I was the first one to admit that uh, the, as we developed the whole timetable all the way till the very end, October 21, 2011, there might be, uh, uh, there, uh, there could have been an error somewhere along the way, and that might impact some of the other dates. But then I found that these proofs tied in with absolute certainty with the dates that we had written about in in uh, 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 in such a book as uh, as Time Has an End. It tied in very accurately, and because the proofs are there, and they came right from the Bible, like there were exactly 7,000 years from the flood of Noah's day till the uh, 2011, and the day that God shut the door of the ark of uh, uh, Noah's day was, according to the biblical calendar of that day, the 17th day of the second month, and May 21, 2011, was also the 17th day of the second month of the biblical calendar that we know about today. And, my, that was just outstanding proofs. And then, when we, uh, uh, someone calculated it, there were 722,500 days from the date that Christ was crucified, which we know with, after working uh, carefully, very, very, very carefully to make sure we had the right day. It was April 1, uh, 33 A.D. Uh, to uh, May 21, 2011, that that was exactly 722,500 days. And then, when that was factored out, as we're able to do in order to look for the spiritual dimension of uh, the spiritual meaning of numbers, if they do have any, we found that it was exactly 5 times 10 times 17 times 5 times 10 times 17 days. 700 equals 722,500. Wow! Five has to do with the atonement. Ten for the completion of God's plan of whatever's in view. Seventeen, going into heaven. And here, those three numbers uh, 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 covered the whole period of time 
from the day God demonstrated how the atonement was done uh, by Christ going to the cross all the way to the very day that that salvation is completed in every sense of the word because that was the day that we receive our resurrected bodies and that's the final, final aspect of salvation and it's exactly 5 times 10 times 17 and then that is doubled, doubled times 5 times 10 times 17 and in Revelation, and in Genesis chapter uh, 41 verse 32 God indicates there that when something is doubled it means that it is definitely established by God to happen and will soon happen and that kind of those kind of proofs are just just uh, just um, um, uh, mind boggling I mean they it just indicates that by God's mercy all the arithmetic that had been done as uh, as the Bible was studied and we came to develop the timeline of history that somehow it had all been done very, very accurately because we've come out to these kind of fruits. And so I can't say anymore uh, it's a high likelihood I would be uh, doing a disservice. I have to be honest and say this is what the Bible teaches. It is going to happen. And uh, and uh, uh, anyone who wants to doubt that or question it, they can do that. But then they will be entering right in to the day of judgment that will go on for the following uh, uh, five months until October 21. Mr. Campy, I, I think you might have misunderstood my question. Uh, the que- I understand what you're saying, and I agree with it. But the question is, do you think it would be wise, knowing what you know now, uh, that uh, we should have the book Time Has an End when there's so many question marks and people are hearing, well, wait a minute, you got a question mark here, baby. It could happen. In, uh, uh, but well, I, could... Oh, I wouldn't be able to do that unless I would add a, a, another uh, chapter to it to indicate the proofs because there has to be a rationale, a reason why you can uh, say it so conclusively. And uh, because uh, Time as an End is a very large book, and and uh, 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 we have that same information uh, uh, pretty well uh, indicated, and in, we're almost there. Uh, uh, I don't intend to make changes in Time as an End, but it does stand as a very, very clear demonstration that we've always tried to be honest with what we're finding in the Bible. Well, the reason why I say this is that you said in the past that you can't say maybe or possibly, but this will definitely happen. I agree with you. I was wondering why not just have the book We Are Almost There on the, on well, the track instead of having people uh, second guess. Well, he said in the other book, and they may not even hear the book We Are Almost There, but they may think, well, this well, is Well, excuse me, excuse me. We're sending out way, way, way more time. We're almost there. Then time has an end. That book is not going out with uh, probably one percent of. We're almost there. So please don't don't be concerned about it. And 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 in fact, is anybody who gets time as an end, if they get serious about studying that, they're going to want any more information, and they will also be receiving the book. We're almost there. So please, and it's a big job to make to uh, to make those corrections and frankly we have so much work to do in reaching the whole world uh, with the uh, warning that judgment day is almost here and we have to be we have to decide where priority uh, where our time priority is and it's not to make a correction in time as an end uh, or an addition it wouldn't be a correction it would be an addition to the time of the end uh, it is uh, it is uh, uh, to get on with a, a lot of other things that we ha- must do as we're approaching the end. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good morning, Mr. Campin. Yes. I have two questions. Um, where in the Bible can I find a passage of Scripture indicating that the Sabbath was changed from Saturday to Sunday? 
Oh, that's in Matthew, for example, in Matthew 28, verse uh, uh, 1 and 2. In the end, uh, and unfortunately, in our English Bible, they've really messed it up. So you can't learn it from the English Bible. You have to be reading the Greek, and you can't trust the English that they put below the Greek either. But if you look at it, it's, you'll find that the word Sabbath there is plural, and it's the word week is the same plural word Sabbath, which means that correctly that verse has to read in the end of the Sabbaths, indicating there's an end of a series of Sabbaths. That was the Sabbath that Christ was lying, his body was in the tomb, as it began to dawn toward the first of the Sabbath. That's early Sunday morning when the women were coming to the tomb to uh, prepared to anoint the body of Jesus, and it's indicating that there's a new era of Sabbath that Sunday morning, and that uh, that uh, there are other verses in the New Testament that uh, give the same idea and also have been messed up by the translators. But uh, without any question, the seventh day Sabbath, which was a part of the ceremonial law and was a shadow of things to come. It was pointing to the fact that we are not to do any work of any kind in trying to become saved. Christ now has done all, has demonstrated that he has done all the work. And now we have the Sunday Sabbath as a day that God has given to us because of our spiritual need for one, for, for a time of spiritual refreshment. And uh, so we try to do uh, the least amount of uh, work of this world on Sunday, uh, using as much of it as possible in, uh, in uh, prayer and in Bible study and sharing the gospel with others and so on. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, how you doing, sir? I um, just want to tell you to read uh, Matthew 24, chapter 4, and think about that. Matthew 24, verse 4. Uh, there we read Matthew 24, verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. Now, what is your question? What is your question? Well, the, I'm not making a prediction. I am simply, uh, you know, you're, you're uh, remarking that uh, I'm making some kind of a prediction, and that's deceiving people. I am simply telling you what the Bible says, and you can check it out. It has been... I'm not just saying that and then running away and hiding. Uh, I'm out here on the open forum five nights a week. I've been here for 48 years, and, and so anybody can call in and challenge me as long as they come with the Scripture. And, uh, and uh, uh, all of these things that I'm talking about are also put into writing so that free of charge you can get a book about this information and it'll show you where this came from in the Bible. So, uh, but on the other hand, there are all kinds of uh, prophets <laughs> and ministers and evangelists and Bible teachers who are teaching this and teaching that and teaching the other thing. Try to find in the Bible what, where, what they are teaching and see if they are faithful to the Word of God. And if you can't find it, it means that they are coming with their kind of a Christ, not the Christ of the Bible. But shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Oh, Mr. Camping, thank you for taking my call. Yes. I, wanted, I just wanted to call and thank you for all the free resources that are on your website. And I want to encourage people to check out your audio 
tapes um, under the English website. There's a wonderful Bible study there where you have, uh, under the basic Bible study, you've talked about the Bible timeline of history, and you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of discussions of the Bible timeline of history that has been so helpful in understanding these end times. So I just encourage the listeners to please go to your website and take advantage of some of those free audios. Thank you so much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Camping. I was um, wanting to know if, you, if Family Radio had any information on um, all of the biblical errors in the King James Bible, if there was like a list of them that we could uh, reference to. No, we have never done that. We've never tried to do that. Uh, 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 we just, <laughs> that's just another task that uh, maybe we could have gotten to, but we just have not had the time to do it. I'm sorry. But thank you for calling and sharing. And, and frankly, uh, if you read the King James Bible, uh, ex the, the major error really has to do with the Sabbath. I, I, I'm just flabbergasted to use the word uh, that uh, that has come into the King James Bible because it is so, so, so wrong. But God has allowed that for his own purposes. But outside of that... Uh, Basically, uh, what we find in the King James Bible has been so accurate that uh, I would not worry about that question. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Mr. Camping, uh, considering all the proofs that God is revealing, um, can we can we equate or tie in together we are almost there, and to God be the glory to the, the very book that was sealed in Daniel. Can we equate we're almost there with this book that was sealed? Oh, no, no, no. You have to remember. Well, it depends on how you want to say that. But remember, the book that was sealed is the Bible. The Bible, we're almost there, is not the Bible. It is not inspired by God. The book that uh, was sealed was inspired by God. And so they're entirely different worlds altogether. But the book almost there is hopefully accurately and faithful to the Bible. But it is not the Bible and must never, never be looked upon as holy as the Bible is holy. But shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, good evening, Brother Campy. Yes. Yes, well, uh, my question is, why does the Bible, the Word of God, endorse slavery, slavery, where it says you can purchase slaves and you can own them and keep them as your property? Well, it, excuse And if you are a slave, you have to obey your masters. Why didn't Jesus or Moses or somebody say slavery is wrong? Well, the fact is, God puts rules in the Bible for following him, like love your enemies, and, uh, and but, but uh, do, do, uh, excuse okay. me, excuse me. But on the other hand, the Bible is a message to the slaves, and uh, uh, nowhere does the Bible endorse uh, rebellion against masters, and, uh, and uh, the Bible indicates that God's that God's presence is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. And even if you're a slave under, uh, under great suffering, you can endure because you have God on your side. And so God uses slavery as a matter of, of showing that however difficult your situation may be, it, it, if God is on your side, you're still the winner. You can endure all the way to the end. That there, uh, in other words, that there's something way, way, way more important to think about than my whether I'm a free man or a bond man. Uh, it, it, it's more important to understand what is my relationship with Christ. But th but there but as we study, if a, if a slave master is reading the Bible, 
he's going to get very uncomfortable about owning slaves, of course, but uh, 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 because uh, then he's not following the Word of God. But uh, God is not setting up a program of trying to break off that yoke. Uh, that would uh, create other uh, uh, rebellion against God in the life of the slave. But shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. How are you doing, sir? Very well, thank you. I have a question for you in regards to uh, May 21st, 2011. Um, the Bible is a, it's supposed to be the living Word of God. Would, you know, that, that, that's a long time from now. Would there, is there a slim possibility that, say, things could change as, you know, it's supposed to be the living Word of Bible and the Bible does change with time? Is there the slimmest possibility that things may change? And uh, if so, um, would it be visible, you know, quite obviously visible in the reading of the Bible and the teaching of the uh, books that were sealed by David? Well, the, 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 <laughs> the fact is that all the information concerning May 21, 2011 comes from the Bible. It is all derived from the Bible, and it's never... Uh, are there because something has been fudged or pushed on or, or well, this is pretty close, maybe it could be this number. No, it all comes from the Bible. And then the proofs also come from the Bible. And so it's the Bible that's at issue. And we can't, we, we can't, uh, uh, if, if God if God has some other teaching that we've messed up, then he will show it to us from the Bible. Uh, the more, as we go toward the end, there were none of us who are true believers cease to study, study, study. And uh, we don't hesitate to make a correction if there is, but my, I'm absolutely in shock when I see the wonderful proofs that God has given us. It is just it just locks it in, and everything locks tighter and tighter as we get near the end. There's no, no, nothing moving along that seems to indicate, well, maybe in time this, this date might change a little bit. There's just nothing showing up like that. That's very reassuring. Thank you, Brother Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, I just wanted to share a verse that I think is perfect for the lady who called about the friend that passed away, and that would be Second Samuel 12, verses 18 to 20. Second Samuel chapter 12. Yes, verse 18. Let's to 20. look at that. Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 18 to 23. To, there we read. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died, and the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, he spake unto him. We spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? This incidentally is talking about the illegitimate son of of. Uh, uh, David, who was uh, conceived out of wedlock, uh, he, he ha engaged in fornication with Bathsheba, who was another man's wife, and uh, now he, then he had her husband marry, uh, or killed rather, in battle, and then he married her to, to somehow hide from anybody that he had engaged in fornication. But God is just putting it all out in big display. But when David saw, and now this child uh, is born, and now it's, it, it got very ill immediately, and it died. And David has been pleading and begging, and, and he has been weeping about this. He couldn't eat any food. How terrible. This child is, is going to die. And probably he had plenty of guilt in his soul. It's going to die because of my sin. That could, that could well be. That caused a lot of this. David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto the servants, Is the child dead? 
And they said, he is dead. Then David did something very surprising. He arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of Jehovah and worshipped. Then he came to his own house. And when he required, they set bread before him and he did eat. Then said his servants unto him, What is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive. But when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. We're going to pause for a moment, and then we'll talk about this. Uh, we've been looking at Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 18 to 23. And this is not a verse that is dealing with uh, uh, just anybody who is dying. It is put in the Bible for a very, very special purpose. You see, back in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 2, we read there a bastard, and that's an old English word for an illegitimate son. Now, this son that died of David was illegitimate. So it ties right into this verse. An a bastard or an illegitimate person shall not enter into the congregation of Jehovah even to the tenth generation shall he not enter into the congregation of Jehovah. In other words, God is using an illegitimate child as a picture of someone who is eternally lost, who cannot become saved, as a picture. But in order to correct any misunderstanding, that means that if you uh, have an illegitimate child or you are looking at an illegitimate person, that does not mean that now that excludes that person from ever becoming saved. That was a portrait that God used uh, that someone who is not saved is like an illegitimate child uh, and a person and, uh, and therefore he is under the wrath of God. But in actuality, an illegitimate person has just as much opportunity or possibility of becoming saved as a, anybody else. And God demonstrates this here in the death of the illegitimate son of David. Because notice what God told David. Notice what he says in verse 23. But now he is dead, wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Now, the only reason David could say that, and this is put in the Bible as the word of God, this is God, words that God is putting into David's mouth, is because God is demonstrating that this illegitimate baby of David, who, who is the type of those who will never, never become saved, but he's only a type, a picture of, but he himself is absolutely a child of God because David said, I shall go to be with him because David indeed was a child of God. And that is the purpose of this account. But shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. Yes. Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah verse, 26. Verse 14. Verse 14. There we read. Let's start with verse 12. Lord, or Jehovah, thou wilt ordain praise for us, for thou also hast wrought all our works in us. O Jehovah our God, other lords beside thee have had dominion over us, but by thee only will we make mention of thy name. They are dead. That is, it's talking about the other lords. 
they shall not live. They are deceased, they shall not rise. Therefore hast thou visited and destroyed them, and made all their memory to perish. That is a very, very excellent passage that is saying it as simply as possible that the unsaved dead are dead, and they'll never again have conscious existence. And I thank you. Thank you for sharing that verse. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi. Yes. I, my question is, why did the Lord Jesus write the Oliver Discord if on down through the years someone could just go and start from Noah's and say, okay, from here until this date, then the rapture is going to happen? Why even, why did he even... Yeah, why did he write, write it? Write the Oliver Discord, you know. If why did he write it? If what? If if what? If you're if you're gonna if someone down through time could just uh, predict that when the rapture is going to happen, why did he even warn us? And well, say, the fact is, the fact is, God wrote the whole Bible, not just the Olivet Discourse, but every word in the Bible in the original languages came from the mouth of God. Uh, and it is all for God's purpose uh, to demonstrate. Uh, finally, it's a demonstration of the wonderful attributes and characteristics and glory, glory, glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. It demonstrates His mercy, His patience, His kindness, His long-suffering, His, uh, uh, his uh, grace, uh, his anger, his uh, justice, and so on. Every single attribute is on display in many, many different ways. Now, the fact is that that we don't need the whole Bible to uh, become saved. But when the Bible says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, we have record of all many people who we know absolutely became saved and all they had of the Bible were maybe a few words or maybe a few, just a few verses. And yet they did become saved. So it isn't because we have a big understanding of the Bible that we become saved. But nevertheless, for God's own purposes, and it's mainly to show the glorious nature of Christ, that is really the big number one, number two, number three, number two ten reason why the Bible is written, uh, and as we try to understand it, we can get more and more con confused uh, unless we have an attitude of, uh, I don't understand this, but oh Lord, I know this, this is the Word of God, and I read enough in it to tremble, know that I'm a sinner, and know that I have to wait upon God somehow to save me. That's finally the bottom line. And, uh, and in the process, God also is giving us the information uh, as, as a mercy of God. Oh, the wonderful mercy of God. He's giving us the precise date when the end will be so that it won't come upon us as a surprise. We can see it coming and can cry out to God for mercy as we, as we recognize, well... You know, I've always thought I was a pretty good person, but now when I think seriously about this, and as I have become better acquainted with the Bible, I know I'm a sinner, and I deserve the wrath of God. And, and oh, I'm so thankful that in this 11th hour, in this time when we're so near the end, I can cry out to God for mercy. Maybe, maybe He'll still have mercy on me. And He does promise that, in this day, he is still saving many, many, many people. And that is, uh, again, the enormous, glorious mercy and love of God that he is so doing. The fact that people mock this or are in complete denial or they don't want to listen or they, they uh, whatever they regard it, 
that is their problem, but they're not recognizing that this information is a gift of God. It is the mercy of God that we can know this and that we can still cry to God for mercy. And God gives us the illustration of the book of Jonah when the Ninevites were given a date, a specific date. They cried for mercy and they sat in sackcloth, sackcloth and ashes. They wept before God. They, and they tried to turn away from their sins as best they could. And, and and begged, oh God, is it possible? Is it possible that this might not happen? And God did answer their prayers, even though he doesn't guarantee that that will bring the answer we're looking for. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, uh, Brother Camping, um uh... Uh, concerning uh, this issue of Sabbath, and uh, there's a lot of people misunderstand the word of Sabbath. And uh, if you allow me to explain to you, I know exactly what's the meaning of Sabbath. Sabbath well, excuse Arabic. me. I, what is your question? This is a question program. What is your question? Not do, you, do you understand ex uh, Exodus chapter 31. Uh, are, are you familiar with that passage as it talks about the Sabbath? Yeah, go ahead and, uh, and uh, read it. Uh, uh, well, what, what, do you, what, do you, what do you remember that I'm it says? I'm trying to say, uh, Brother Camping, well, the Sabbath, fact, Sabbath has two meanings. Well, uh, excuse me. Uh, the, uh, the Bible is very clear in Exodus chapter 31. And, uh, and uh, until you t uh, have factored this in, you really don't know what the meaning of Sabbath is. In Exodus 31, God says there that uh, uh, in verse 13, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily, my Sabbath ye shall keep. And the only Sabbath that was in view in those days was the seventh-day Sabbath. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations. Now, a sign is something that points to something. And what does it point to? That ye may know that I'm I not, am Jehovah, I, I'm that not, doth sanctify you. That is the meaning of the Sabbath, that you are not to do any work because it's teaching you that even as you try to become saved, you must not trust in any work that you have done. And that's why it goes on. Ye shall keep the Sabbath, therefore. It is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. And that's a big statement. In other words, God, what's it pointing to? That I sanctify you. And so if you try to believe that you've done something that helped you to become saved, you are going to end up under the wrath of God. We have to recognize that all the work of saving was done by the Lord Jesus. And that is the meaning of the seventh-day Sabbath. And that's why when you go to Numbers 15, are you familiar with that? That I, a man picked up some sticks on the Sabbath day. And, what did, and, and Moses went to God and said, What shall we do to him? And God said, Execute him. And he was stoned to death. Do you know why that was? Do you know why that was? Brother Camping, let me, let me just uh, say this. I, I agree with everything you said. I said the meaning of Sabbath, uh, it's, it's Arabic language, means number seven. Seven, and also it means uh, the whole week. And same thing with the Hebrew, Shabbat. Shabbat means seven, and also means the whole week, a complete set of uh, seven days. And that's, uh, I, I agree with everything you said. I'm not a seven-day Adventist. I've been uh, observing Sunday since I was born. I'm just trying, I, I see, I do understand the language, and I'm trying to help out so that you can do your own investigation. I agree everything you said there. The Sabbath also, uh, it's brought in uh, in the Bible and Old Testament concerning seven Seven days. It's uh, it's uh, of uh, whatever uh, they, God is uh, talking about. A Sabbath uh, year it means the seventh year. 
and uh, th- that is uh, why it makes it difficult to uh, to uh, in, in my case, I listened to it, and then uh, you mentioned that Bible is mistranslated. No, they did a good job, except you have to understand the word Sabbath has two meanings. One is complete we uh, seven days, and the other one is day seven. And that is uh, in Arabic and Hebrew. And you can, uh, you can check with anybody. I wish you do a lot of uh, checking on this, because Hebrew Aramaic... Shabbat means seven, and okay. also it means whole seven, a set of seven days. Okay. And it's so simple if you just uh, think about that for a while while you're reading the sentence and say, let me try this. The, it, since, uh, since Sabbath has two meanings, let's see how the sentence uh, 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 explains to us. Uh, thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. I, I just started listening to your program on the truck driver and, um, and pretty much a, a new Christian. But I was, but I do have two questions for you. The first one is, is that the Temple Mount needs to be rebuilt before Jesus comes back. That's the teaching that I grew up, uh, learning. All, all of that, it, all of that kind of teaching has absolutely no biblical basis. In fact, it is a total misunderstanding. The temple is never uh, the Israel. God is finished with Israel. He's using them to illustrate what he uh, what he prophesied in in uh, Romans chapter 11 that uh, as long as any Gentiles had to become saved, they would remain in unbelief, and that's true right to the very present day. Uh, that uh, they are a proof that uh, that of another prophecy that they would again be a nation, and they are a nation, but they're a nation in leaf. And there's no fruit of any kind, and uh, and uh, uh, all the language about building a temple and all of that has got to be understood spiritually it has, uh, that that has all been wrongly taught there's no possibility uh, they're, they're simply uh, we're, we're 22 months away from the very end of the world and, and uh, Israel will be destroyed right along with all the others who are to be, enter into the day of judgment so my second question is, is in the Bible it says that the dead will rise again to be with with Jesus. Yes. Is my misunderstanding something that the dead of all time will will rise or when you die? Like I was listening earlier about the lady uh, who right. wanted to pray for I lost right. my father-in-law a couple months ago, and I know he wasn't safe. So, uh, but for the ones that when you die, you, your soul automatically goes to heaven? If, if you are a true child of God, it means that you have been given a brand new resurrected soul, an eternal soul, at the moment you became saved. And that made a very huge difference in your life because now you have an intense uh, love for the Bible, you tremble at the Word of God, you uh, you you uh, can only want to do God's will, uh, and you know that you have to keep your eye on Christ because uh, you know you still have a body that has not been saved. But it also means that when you die, you're going to leave your body, and your soul is going to leave your body and go to live with live with Christ in heaven. Uh, but on the other hand, if you die unsaved, your body is put in the grave, and you, it's, that's the end of you. You'll never have conscious existence again. On the other hand, the body of the one who had become saved will be resurrected when Christ returns, a glorified spiritual body, and be caught up to be in heaven, so that again we'll be a whole personality, but now we'll be eternally with Christ forever and ever. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. Yes. Hi. Glory be to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. 
O oh God, take out our hearts of stone and give us hearts of flesh. Now, what well, is your excuse yes, me? What is your turn, question? What is your question? Yes, please turn to one Corinthians chapter thirteen. Please read verse one and two. First Corinthians chapter thirteen. Verse 1 and 2, there we read, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am become as sounding brass or a stinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. And, you, and uh, what is your question now? Yes, I wanted to comment that Jesus said, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you. And how, my, how my, my comment is that we should be more tender-hearted to one another. Well, excuse we, me, excuse me, excuse me. The fact is, we think, we think that in our love, we must always speak compassionately to someone and, and never really... Uh, try to uh, correct them in any way because that brings tension but the fact is that's not love if we have a loved one or someone that we're deeply concerned with God says love your neighbor as yourself now what is well, how do we love ourselves? what is the highest good that we have for ourselves is that we have become a child of God because then we have eternal life. And if I love my neighbor as I love myself, then what I desire for that person is that that person might also have eternal life. And so in order to have, uh, give him, uh, that he might have eternal life, I have to be faithful to what the Bible is teaching, even though this may hurt his feelings, even though he may not like it, but uh, it would not be a, uh, an act of love uh, to uh, agree with him when he is saying something disagree uh, 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 contrary to the Bible, because then I am encourage him to remain in disbelief, and that that's the worst thing I could do to him. That would show that I hate him. I want to see him die. And so, yes, it is difficult, very difficult, to show love all the time as we share the gospel. But if we share it humbly and uh, faithfully, and uh, uh, we, uh, it still is a, a, a supreme act of love, and particularly then as we pray for them. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. Yeah. I have two things to say. First, I want to thank you for your overall patience with us. I know we ask, a lot of us ask the same questions every night, and you're very patient with that. Um, my call is in reference to the first caller, um, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 5. There we read. Chapter 9, verse 5. Yes. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything, neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Does there, that tie into her question? I'm sorry? Does that scripture tie into her question when she was... Well, it does help. In other words, there's a lot of references in the Bible to indicate that when we're dead, we're dead. and uh, and But we're not used to it because we've been taught for years and years throughout the church age, and I myself for, for decades taught otherwise that, yeah, you're dead, but you're going to resurrect again at the end of time, and you're going to stand before the judgment throne of God and you're going to be found guilty, and you're going to be thrown into a place called hell, and you're going to be tormented there forever and ever. 
and that has really been ground into us and now uh, it's uh, it's hard to get used to the idea that no that is not going to happen that is contrary to the law of God that cannot happen we have been uh, been taught wrongly all together uh, throughout time that was simply a crutch a, a club that the church used uh, and there virtually every church used it to get people uneasy uh, so that they would at next, ask the next question well then how can I escape all of that that's horrible what you're teaching me well now you come to our church we'll show you how you can become saved and and then they give them a formula that they have to accept Christ and they have to be baptized in water and and uh, become a member of the congregation, faithful to all the rules of the congregation. And now you're a confessing member, and uh, you can believe that you are truly saved. And so it was a very, very convenient uh, uh, club club uh, to uh, push people into a kingdom of God idea that actually was leading them to hell forevermore to death because it was a do-it-yourself salvation program beginning already with when they talked about the nature of God's wrath but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please oh we have one time for one more quick call good good evening hello hello Yes. yes Yes, um, I wanted to ask you in reference to the Ten Commandments that were given, which includes the Sabbath. So are you saying that all of that laws that were given, which includes the Sabbath, we should forget about and now look to the New Testament, and that the Old Testament have nothing to do with it, even though it's God's work? Absolutely not. The Ten Commandments are exceedingly important, just as important as anything in the New Testament. And the fourth commandment about the Sabbath is not a moral law, it's a ceremonial law. That was explained in Exodus 31. It is a sign pointing to the fact that I sanctify thee. In other words, it is put in the Ten Commandments to warn us. Now look, there are nine commandments here that are all uh, moral. You're not to have any other gods before me. You're not to kill. You're not to commit adultery. But don't think that you can be good enough to keep all those because if you do, you're going to end up under the wrath of God. Uh, you, uh, just like you're not to do any work on the seventh day Sabbath, remember, you can't by your good works at all get yourself a right with God. You have to look for a Savior. And that was the point of the fourth commandment. But... We have come to the end of our time until our next open forum. We want to keep reading the Bible, keep studying, and until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you. Good night.